life I finished quite abruptly uh, on uh, Sunday <coughs> in um, chapter 10. This is uh, John Marshall Grant speaking from the heart, Ethics, Reincarnation and What It Means to be Human, edited by Nicola Bennett, Jane La and Sophia Rossoff. And uh, this chapter is chapter 10. It is the years from 1958 to 1970. And uh, chapter 8 is uh, the body-soul duality. These are lectures of Joan Grant's. And I um, uh, start here at that chapter which I uh, interrupted. If a celibate prays with sufficient fervor, fervor for the gift of continence, he may render his supra-physical body impotent until he realizes his error before he dies or, during his excarnate period, asks to be relieved of his disability. It is probable that a later physical body, either male or female, will suffer from some form of sexual malfunction. Unfortunately, people who have prayed for something which they later recognize to be the last thing they really wanted often find that false pride prevents them asking to be cured. And however well-wishing and efficient the healer may be, and whatever level of consciousness he may be operating on, a cure cannot take place without the full cooperation of the patient. Eventually, even the most stubborn will be driven to ask for help, even though this entails having to admit, however humiliating this admission may seem to be, that only a blind obedience to dogma or terror of taboo had caused him to waste a great deal of time and energy on his knees. A woman who has suffered many unwanted pregnancies or who has died in terror after an abortion or during childbirth may try to protect herself from the repetition of such an unhappy experience by making her next body infertile. If her next body is male, she may try to prevent herself inflicting similar trials on anyone else by causing it to be sterile. Another device to which she may resort is to, do, is to condition her new body that it can be sexually attracted by only, only by a member of the same sex, a by no means uncommon cause of both male and female homosexuality. There are of course, many physical fears which are not due to the self-inflected injuries of an earlier supra-physical body. Often an apparently irrational fear is the body's far memory, warning it against the repetition of some painful incident in its long history. For instance, in spite of my most passionate determination to learn how to dive, spurred on by the scorn of my contemporaries and my own vanity, which cringed at having to walk furtively down the steps of a swimming bath while other young, young women poised elegantly on the diving board. I am invariably jerked my head before it touched the water. I invariably jerked my head in before it touched the water. I did innumerable belly flops before I finally had to accept that I did not know how to stop Joan's body resonating to an earlier one who had accidentally broken his neck on a submerged rock. A few years ago I tried to cure my terror of snakes by getting someone to catch a slow worm so that I could get used to handling it. Having organized this experiment, I was confident that I could carry it off, especially as I knew the reptile was entirely harmless. I can recall the episode as though it were happening now, instead of ten years ago. I was not aware of any anxiety. In fact, I was mildly embarrassed that I had started with something so easy instead of with a proper snake. I can see the little slow worm curled up confidently in that kindly man's hand. I can see my own hand stretching out to pick it up. And then my hand stopping in mid-air as though it had been arrested by a pane of glass. I spent nearly an hour trying to touch that slow worm, feeling more and more foolish becoming increasingly angry with myself. But I could not force my hand six inches of it, within six inches of it. I knew my body was in no danger, but my body could remember, although at that time I could not 
that at least three of my early employees had died in agony and terror from snake bite. Unfortunately, reliving these three ple unpleasant deaths has done nothing to cure my fear. Either there is another snake incident which I am still dodging or else, which is more probable, I could cure myself only by a slow process of de deconditioning, perhaps starting with a very small dead snake. I cannot blame my body for being weary of carrying out my instructions, for I have far too often caused it needless misery by refusing to heed its excellent advice. I regret to say that there have been frequent occasions when Joan has misinterpreted instincts kindly hints, offered by her body for their mutual well-being, as a sign of rebellion from an unfaithful servant. Instead of allowing my body to rest when it was overtired, I drove it to increase and usually futile activities. I then added insult to injury by blaming it for stopping me thinking properly, because it wailed that I had given it a pain. I have at least learned that pain is nearly always a shriek for help from the body to the other partner of its duality. When that other partner, motivated by forced pride or some other form of idiocy, has refused to listen to the originally calm and painless direction of instinct. I have been even more untrust and un I have been an even more untrustworthy partner to some of my earlier bodies. I have imposed a variety of pointless aestheticism on more than one of them, in the utterly mistaken belief that by so doing I was burnishing my soul. On at least two other occasions I had forced my body patiently to endure intercourse with another body which it found repellent, and made myself believe that it was dutiful to do so. Merely one of the opponents in this drab routine was labelled wife and the other husband. Duty, which is almost invariably the excuse for doing something which we know to be wrong, in this case was the excuse for forgetting that adultery, sex without joy, is a blasphemy against the body's divinity. I wish I could claim this definition of adultery as my own, but it was coined by one of the few real priests I have met in this century. He died just before he was ordained as a bishop of the Church of England and used to electrify his congregation by thundering from the pulpit. 99% of adultery takes place in the marriage bed. There was also a time when I was so careless of my body's safety that I insisted on voicing my beliefs, although I knew that by doing so I would make no dent in the dark walls of dogma, in which the people of that century had allowed themselves to be imprisoned, but instead would expose myself to the risk of being burned alive. And I was burned alive, which was far too high a price to pay for the comfort of confirming my faith in my own integrity. But at least no one else suffered, and the crowd found a witch burning as stimulating as a modern crowd finds a crash in an automobile race. However, however, I was not always lucky enough only to damage myself. In the 12th century, I made a handsome and healthy body of which I was fond, caused great discomfort to itself and others by by doning armour and inflicting damage on similarly deluded males. Eventually that body died by having a po poignard driven through its right eye, an incident I still remember far too vividly for comfort. I think what keeps it so clearly defined is the shocked amazement I felt when my visor was opened and instead of seeing the smiling face of my squire about to unbuckle my harness and help me to my feet, I saw the face of my vanquished opponent, Squire, who in a torrent of vengeful anguish proceeded to dispatch me. I felt even sorrier for myself shortly afterwards, for instead of being praised for a lifetime of chivalry, I was told very briskly indeed that I 
would have lived much closer to the great pattern if I had listened to my instinct, which had implored me to stay at home, to cultivate my garden and the love of my wife. As I have said earlier, I believe that it is as though as it, it, that it is through our bodies and our souls that we learn to make those benign choices, whose sum total is the strength of our spirit. And I also believe that we waste a great deal of time and energy if we refuse to accept that the things which are learned through the five senses of the physical body are even more important than what we learn through our intellect. Intellect being the aspect of each soul which is not immortal, although the way in which our intellect is used or misused affects the quality and efficiency of our later intellects. Most systems which are concerned with the nature of man and his development are agreed that man has something to learn on this planet before he becomes an acceptable inhabitant of a more exalted sphere of activity. So I find it difficult to understand why so many of these systems claim that the pupil can best obtain his objective by resolutely playing truant from the school whose lessons he wishes to learn. Sorry, that's my cat scratching. For surely it is playing truant to have a physical body which one puts to minimal use. Surely it is playing truant to imagine that it is meritorious to scamper off to other levels of reality as an escape from learning how to use our energy in a three-dimensional field, the field for which our physical bodies have been specifically adapted. Because in our present world population there is an inadequate percentage of people who have extrasensory perception. We have a scarcity value like plumbers when too many pipes have burst after a freak frost. But the capacity to be aware of two levels of reality at the same time is only a technique. Like any other technique, it is the result of practice, and in no way whatsoever is it, is it in itself a sign of spiritual advancement. <laughs> Having had extrasensory perception in varying degrees for more than 6,000 years, I can state empirically that we are always off the beam when we try to deny instead of striving to develop any of our five senses. For to do so is not only to set a needless limitation on our three-dimensional capacities, but to reduce our capacity on other levels of reality. So disciplines which instruct their followers to subjugate the body in the hope of elevating the soul are based on a fallacy. The fallacy that if energy appropriate to one part of the body-soul duality remains unused, it can be employed in the service of the other part of that duality. As I have already said, the role of our bodies, both physical and supraphysical, is to perfect our sensory perceptions, so that through our five senses we can increase the range of our potential choices, and so increase our capacity to choose benignly. Therefore, it is tragic that relatively few people spare time from their hectic 20th century round to cultivate their senses, and that those who neglect to do so seldom realize that to allow such a vital part of their totality to remain fallow is to retard their progress towards the next stage of man's evolution. How many of us really try to increase our ability to touch? to see, to hear, to taste, and to use our noses. How many of us make full use of our sense of touch, except by the, blend, by the blind and certain osteopaths and masseurs, touch is the most aggrievously neglected of our five senses. And yet, it is the most important for the vital energy of affection can be more easily transmitted by skin-to-skin -skin contact. From in infancy, the majority are deprived of this basic need, although now it is sometimes prescribed for delicate babies under the chilly heading of TLC, which is short for tender loving care. Very few children have the natural solace of being caressed in mutual nakedness even by their parents. 
So it is not at all surprising that the, they grow up with such a pl pressure of unsatisfied longing that they snatch at the only outlet available to them, which is premature and pitifully ineffectual sexual experiments. Ineffectual because it is not sex they really crave. It is physical affection, which, as their body memory of more kindly cultures, is constantly reminding them is their natural right. If you doubt the validity of what I'm saying, I suggest you try to communicate with an animal without touching it. You can talk to your dog, walk your dog, but refrain even for a day from touching your dog and see what happens. At first it will be bewildered and then it will presume that you are angry with it and produce symptoms of guilt. If you continue with the experiment, the dog, according to its character, will either mope or whine and snarl, snarl at you or run away. I believe that by failing to give our children the comfort and reassurance we still, we shall, we still give to our dogs, we produce in them the same patterns of behavior. They mope or whine or snarl at us or run away to join the lonely hordes of juvenile delinquents. In any case, any of you are thinking that although this theory sounds plausible, it would be far too dicey to put into practice. I can offer a few words of reassurance. Although I have given birth to only one child, a daughter, I have had plenty of other children living with me for months and sometimes years. At the peak period when I was living in Wales during the war, I had nine of them, six males and three females, the youngest being seven and the eldest nineteen. They wore clothes only when it was necessary to conform with other people's conventions for convenience, to protect themselves from brambles or when they felt cold. They shared baths with each other and with me, and would have thought it preposterous if even the grown-ups had worn bathing suits when swimming in the lake. They wandered in and out of each other's rooms, and I often found two or three of them curled up asleep together like puppies in a basket. But in spite of the gloomy predictions of my acquaintances, there was never any problem about sex. One of the things I taught them was to how to develop their sense of touch by identifying objects and textures with their eyes shut. With very little practice, they could easily differentiate between 30 or more species of leaves, as well as being able to recognize a tree by the feel of its bark by touching it with the tip of one finger. There are still traditions such as the laying on of hands which indicate the beneficent uses which can be made of our sense of touch. So why don't we cultivate our innate ability to relieve pain, to quieten anxiety and transmit affection? Regrettably this talent usually remains dormant, for the majority of people seem to have forgotten that it even exists. Not long ago I recalled a happy and acceptable life as a Chinese concubine. From childhood she was taught how to increase the flexibility of her hands and the sensitivity of her fingertips. By the time she was 13, the difference between the texture of one flower petal and another was as obvious to her as the difference between harsh tweed and smooth linen would be to most of us. To protect to protect her fingers, she wore artificial nails when off duty. The metal from which these were made and their length were a symbol of her excellence in the art of love, just as the height of a chef's bonnet now indicates his place in the hierarchy of the art of cooking. She lived a couple of thousand years ago, and as the Chinese also forgot that love in all its aspects is the greatest of the arts, the original significance of the finger guards was forgotten and Chinese women grew non-retractable claws as a status symbol. I'll stop this here for now and I'll continue another time. Please like and subscribe. <laughs>